welcome to On the Block with Andrew Gurevich, a podcast about authentic people doing beautiful things. Enjoy the show. So I was talking last week about a concept that's been kicked around lately in psychology called benign masochism. You know, this is uh, the literary purge of pity and fear that Aristotle spoke about. This is when we, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, eat spicy food or uh, go on a roller coaster or engage in uh, risky behaviors that uh, put us right up to the edge of danger and destruction, but uh, let us walk back from it relatively unscathed, jumping out of an airplane, uh, listening to cold play, you know, these things that bear the marks of utter destruction, <clears throat> but uh, somehow let us sneak out the back door um, without, without destroying ourselves. And what that does for the human psyche, a kind of a trial run for when these things occur in our life. It purges our ability or, or actually intensifies our ability if we do it um, with this intention to feel uh, the plight of another and thus uh, strengthen those empathic bonds. Uh, it's a fascinating thing about humanity that we do this, that we have these kinds of um, meditative activities that even if we don't know why we're engaging in them, we all engage in them. Uh, for similar uh, and diverse purposes, but uh, there's an underlying bedrock of, 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 of intention that's there. I bring this up because there's another thing that we humans do, or at least many of us, that I find really interesting. It's this impulse we have uh, to go to large bodies of water. And, uh, you know, and I don't mean water sports or, uh, you know, some of the other things we do, surfing, swimming, uh, kayaking. I mean, uh, just simply the impulse to go to the ocean or a large body of water and just stare at it. Uh, it was E.E. E. Cummings who said, for whatever we lose, it is always ourself we find in the sea. Um, and I think many of you can relate to what I'm talking about, this idea that uh, when we're staring at water, when we're staring at a big body of water, we're in a sense staring into some aspect of ourselves. Um, poets, psychologists, and marine biologists have written a great deal about this. Uh, and as it turns out, so have the scientists. There's an emerging body of literature that is looking at this very issue, this issue of where we come from and that we come from water and our very self emerges from water. And so this is a fascinating field of study that our guest for this week is on the very, very forefront of looking into. Our guest this week is a guy named Dr. Bruce Damer, who is uh, just about to introduce or has just introduced uh, a new model on the origins of life called the coupled phases model. Now, <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. I mean, what, <laughs> I don't know what you've done lately, but I have not been working on introducing a new model on the origins of life and one that's actually getting a good deal of traction in the scientific community, uh, folks like uh, Bruce and his colleagues are looking, um, David Deemer specifically, looking at physical evidence for life on the planet in the form of fossils in Australia and in Greenland that are going back 3.7 billion with a B years. They're looking at these structures in the rocks called stromatolites. And I'll let uh, Bruce speak to it when we get into the interview. But what's fascinating is this is these are things produced by the activity of microbes. Um, and in these kind of saline lagoons in a few locations around the world, um, you get this kind of bathtub ring as the water rises and, and drops. Um, you get that ring around the outside of microbial activity, right? And these fossils um, that they're finding, as I said, about 3.5, uh, 3.5, 3.7 billion years old, pushing the discovery of life uh, even earlier back into Earth's history. Um, and what it seems to be suggesting is that uh, even as early as 4.1 billion years ago, these, these genetic uh, molecular clocks are showing us that uh, life existed on this planet and has existed in this unbroken chain uh, since then, what uh, this is fascinating information to consider, and this is not out of the ocean, but out of uh, freshwater pools. Um, so upending all that we thought we know 
about the origins of life on this planet. So honored to talk to Bruce about that uh, right at the time when this theory is going to be breaking. There's a New York Times article and several other things coming out about it that we get into. Uh, one of the tantalizing suggestions that Bruce brings up um, as a kind of metaphor for this is that these early microbial communities uh, were only able to and continue to be uh, the most successful living organisms on the planet because of their uh, ability to share this endosymbiosis, this massive endosymbiosis, he calls it, this, the implications that um, these, uh, these organisms can survive in very harsh conditions and uh, very simple conditions if they uh, freely and regularly share all of their information, all of their assets with one another. And so there's a metaphor there, isn't there, uh, for what's coming for humanity. Um, <clears throat> that uh, we will be successful to the point that we are able to set our differences aside uh, and emphasize that we are one global uh, community and uh, must live in harmony and, and I know this sounds like hippie bullshit but this is really the only option we have uh, and in deep deep empathic bonds with each other and with our non-human brothers and sisters on the planet so Bruce is a scientist and a visionary um, <clears throat> who's doing some fascinating work in this area he's also doing a lot of work in space exploration and space travel uh, working to create some fueling opportunities for folks like Elon Musk and others who are trying to go to Mars. So he's a pretty interesting dude. He's a cat that does a lot of work, a lot of non-drug-induced work in inducing states of liminality, liminal space, that waking consciousness in between dream space and waking consciousness, that in between the threshold space, that shamanic space, uh, Bruce tries to develop that space and actually work with it for his uh, with his intuition and that dream uh, mind in order to uh, develop his scientific theories. Uh, it's a fascinating thing going all the way back to Aboriginal culture. I talk about it all the time when the Aboriginal line, it's important to know the song line of your dreaming. And Bruce is a guy that works with that liminality uh, in really, really fascinating ways to produce some really tangible results in his own life. Uh, what I dig about Bruce is when you see him, you know, unless you're part of the, the kind of Burning Man hippie community, when you see Bruce and he's head to toe in tie-dye and he's got the hair, you know, and he's got that grin on his face, it's really, really easy to dismiss the dude. Even if you're in that community, um, you know, he's awesome, but uh, you see him and you're like, you think you got him down. You think you go, okay, here comes one of these bongo playing kind of spacey, uh, you know, brainless hippie cats, right? And then he opens his mouth and this, this multidisciplinary scientist, <clears throat> designer, artist, um, you know, the work he's doing, as I said, in evolutionary biology and space travel, uh, suddenly you realize you're talking to some kind of crazy Canadian super genius. Uh, and so I love that about him. I love that he's a guy that defies easy categorization. He also runs uh, a fantastic uh, computer museum uh, at his home, uh, at his barn, the Digibarn, in Northern California, and we didn't get a chance to talk about much about that, but you can go online and see like Wozniak and, uh, and Jobs and other people coming to visit this place because it's really sort of the world's most extensive collection of uh, early computing artifacts. Uh, so he's a, he's a multi-talented, uh, sort of multi-faceted cat, and we were super stoked to have him on the show. Um, you know, I think you're going to enjoy our conversation. It's wide ranging. He's a heady dude. Um, but he's also really accessible and down to earth. He was uh, dear friends and colleagues with uh, the controversial figure to many of you, and some of you might not know the person I'm talking about, Terrence McKenna. Um, <clears throat> Terrence and Bruce were close, especially in the final years of uh, Terrence's life, and we have a pretty interesting conversation about that. So buckle up and uh, you know, pour yourself a cold one and get ready for a wide-ranging and bizarre conversation with a fellow that I just think you're, you're going to dig, Dr. Bruce Damer. All right, folks, thank you for being with us on On the Block Radio. This is your host, Andy Gervich, and we will see you on the other side.
week with Bruce Damer, who's one of the great mavens of interactive virtual worlds. New work in science is showing that it may be, you know, subject to experimental testing, it may be that life started as a community. So the, the basic unit of life was not necessarily the individual cell, but it was a collection of cells in a gel that formed on mineral surfaces in hot spring environments. And that, that gel, which could have contained you know, hundreds, thousands, or even millions of protocells or early life cells, was the basic unit selected for you know, by nature or by process to ignite life on Earth. 
And so that communal beginning makes sense because an individual cell that has learned the trick of dividing itself, of pulling in resources, doing metabolism, and then being able to make a division to make two cells, if it's on its own in the hot spring, it's subject to shear forces and pH changes and temperature, and it's likely to just get dissolved, just get disrupted. If that cell is in a matrix with other cells, then they're sharing nutrients, they're sharing molecular tools in a kind of early horizontal gene transfer. And it's the community that matters. And the likelihood of survival of one fragile early life cell is much higher in the community. But the work has more meaning beyond just a scientific theory. It may speak to the fact that we began as a, as a community and we will survive only as a community. And that the conception of competing individuals that perhaps we've been under for several hundred years uh, through, um, you know, in our economic systems, in our political systems, this concept of the survival of the fittest may not be serving us well and may not be, in fact, the true way that where the true way we began as life on the planet and that we persist as life on the planet. a storyteller and he's bringing on the tradition of storytelling from Terence McKenna because he's worked with him so you guys are in for quite a delicious adventurous journey with Bruce let's give Dr. Bruce our awesome love welcome him thank you for being here But what I'm going to do today is to tell you a story which may be the most important story that you've ever heard. Mitochondrial Eve was born. Mitochondrial Eve, the common mother of us all. She was a mutant. She was a magnificent mutant. And her genes were so different that she was probably the oddest kid ever born to a, a community. And we don't know where she was born. Was she born in South Africa? Was she born in Kenya? But we have one mother because our mitochondria, the little part of our cells that make energy, have one genetic code. We have a common mother. Does this tell us something? A common mother. What happens when you have a common mother? What, what does that mean? You're all brothers and sisters, right? We're all brothers and sisters. But there was one other place that the women were doing something even more powerful, even more powerful, which is in the matrilineal lineage of mitochondrial Eve, where their teachers, they set up something called a mystery school. The mystery schools were an outgrowth of the upper Paleolithic's tradition of initiating people when they were young, because any tribal or indigenous culture realizes if you don't provide initiation for youth, especially males, they go off, right? You've got to level them down. You've got to mature them. You have to smooth them out. You have to have them face fears. You have to have them face limits for God's sakes. And so the upper Paleolithic communities always had initiation for their males. And this grew into the mystery schools. What do you, what do you have when you have a civilization with no initiation? You have the juvenile going further and further into adulthood. You know, people never grow up because that's what the, the Paleolithic communities knew. People are craving initiation. They're creating, craving contact with a powerful entity, with a, with a powerful force that's bigger than the default world, you call it, right? The, the, the world of, that is being fed to us. Out of the Eleusinian experience, the initiation came the theater, mathematics, engineering, you know, the concepts of abstract holistic thinking, beautiful art came out of Eleusis. It was the transforming mechanism. That light birthed the classical world.
You're listening to On the Block, where geniuses go to twerk. All right, welcome to the show, folks. This is your host, Andy Gervich. Our guest this week is Dr. Bruce Damer. Dr. Bruce is a Canadian-American multidisciplinary scientist, designer, and speaker. Do not hold the American side against him. Uh, he works in evolutionary, evolutionary biology, researching the question of the origins of life and the exploration and economic development of space. He also has a practice in the design of innovative software systems interfaces and a passion for collecting and curating historical archives and computing history and leading figures of the counterculture. Dr. Damer performs as a storyteller on a range of subjects under the moniker science plus vision equals hope. He began performing in 2003 and is featured at venues such as Burning Man and the Esalen Institute. He also performs at music festivals and art festivals worldwide, covering topics ranging through science, space, deep evolutionary history, questions of origins, and the meaning, of, and, the meaning and future of the human enterprise. Bruce tells what he calls bridging stories, which cross many cultural, artistic, and intellectual frames to bring people together around the essential truths of their shared humanity. Many of his talks may be found online through podcasts such as the Joe Rogan Experience, the Psychedelic Salon, the Biata Podcast, most recently the Duncan Trussell Family Hour, and his own show, the Levity Zone Podcast. Dr. Damer is a follower of a scientific version of the philosophy of liminality, occupying a liminal boundary between rational, reductionist, materialist approaches to reality, but open to inspiration from alternative states of consciousness. He has built a practice of, into, of intentionally seeking visionary experiences through meditative states that could be grounded in scientific insights or guiding stories. Dr. Bruce, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you on. Thank you, Andrew. Well, let's start there. The last part of your bio that I read, you've built a practice of intentionally seeking visionary experiences through meditative states that could be grounded in insights, uh, scientific insights or guiding stories. I, I had this idea a while back uh, and I thought it was my idea. And then a friend of mine told me that I, that I, he thinks I got this from listening to the psychedelic salon <laughs> and old Terrence McKenna talk. So it wasn't yeah. my idea at all. So you'll be able to straighten this out. But the idea I had was, uh, or that I apparently stole from Terrence was that we could, we could take the Hubble telescope and point it um, at various celestial objects and then um, pipe the image into a, a, a room and put a bunch of scientists, poets, artists, philosophers into the, into the room, put them in, in a comfortable chair in front of a, a high-definition television, give them all DMT, and then let them interact directly with that celestial object. Uh, and my friend said, yeah, I think Terrence said something like that. So I guess my first question is, did I steal that from Terrence? Do you remember him talking about something like that? And secondly, uh, give us some examples of how you do that, of how this practice of intentionally seeking visionary experiences through meditative states and then grounding those in scientific insight. That's the uh, first answer. I, I wouldn't put it past Terrence. That sounds ter <laughs> Terrence-like. Um, the second, you know, uh, it, would it be so easy you know, would it be so easy? Because I think you have to blend everything together. You have to use reductionism and reason and things like that. But it, it turns out if you if you look at scientific history, most of the great change makers, the great paradigm shifters, mm -hmm. were mystics. Yeah, they were mystics. Whether it be Isaac Newton, who was a liminal practitioner i mean he was on the boundary between alchemy and and physics really and and then you've got descartes you know who supposedly an angel came to him him one night and told him about number and measure and then the the ultimate example in our time is perhaps albert einstein hmm. who did his dreams his thought experiments where he was riding on a, a waves of a beam of light you know and he would he would just open himself to those imaginative states and then just receive. So he wasn't conceiving, he was receiving. Wow. And and he, you know, he came up with special relativity based upon one of these things, I think when he was 16, you know. I so believe when, Watson, uh, the Crick and Watson uh, conversations and experiments about the, the you know, the intuiting of uh, the, the double helix, a uh, similar story. Yeah, yeah, and <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, science goes back and forth between 
the mystics, who really are the leaders of science, mm. uh, but who are masters of the reductionist part. But then the the laboratory technician sort of side of science is, I think of them as the monks in the monastery, mm. you know, the ones that illustrate the manuscripts or write the detailed peer-reviewed papers. Yeah. And, and the mystics can do that too, but but they do have armies of people to either test or refute their their theories and they just keep coming up with stuff you know where does this stuff come from yeah visionary stuff Um, one of the things i teach in my world literature classes we read uh we read goethe's faust and there's that great part in the beginning when uh he says he's spent his life rummaging in phrases and he's not gotten any closer to a a unified image of the cosmos and he finally turns to magic uh, to provide him with this because it's the it's the you know, it, the science of transformations and and this is why he goes to alchemy and to magic is to study transformations because in studying how one thing becomes another uh, he hopes to find some some clue into the origins of life and the meaning of it and you're you're absolutely right about this connection between mystics and that essential truth. You know, I I uh, had a dream, a very very intense. It was a lucid dream. Uh, one morning, you know, lucid dreams being that you're kind of almost awake, yeah. but they're completely, I mean, they're almost psychedelic. Mm-hmm. And and one of them was, I was approaching this seething cloud of what looked like, you know, tiny blobs. Wow. And I was coming up to it, and it was just, it was a firestorm of molecules moving around and around and around. And I, I, I pushed into it. Now, this is about 10 years ago. So I thought, okay, okay, here it is. I'll push into it. This is this is a lot like my first thought experiment when I was 14. When Walking I, through the mountains in Canada, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I asked the question, how did life begin? You know, how did, how did life start? How did the algorithm of molecules come together on its own to make life? And I saw a small bundle of molecules... Uh, just it right in my mind's eye literally they just appeared hmm. uh while i was walking in the sagebrush and uh then it asked me a question because i was pretty surprised <laughs> but I, I i knew this was a thought experiment and i had read about albert einstein and thought i can do that um you know when you're 14 you you don't have a lot of other training uh, <laughs> but it asked me the question figure out how i made a copy of myself hmm. so while I was doing my PhD work about eight, nine years ago, we were building this giant simulation engine network called the Evolution Grid, which would do molecular dynamics stuff, a little bit what like what Ramez was talking about yeah, in the yeah. podcast. But it, it made the made basically a huge noisy landscape of cosmochemistry of individual atoms bouncing around. And I, I derived an algorithm to climb, to hill climb through this noisy space hmm. mm-hmm. and, and characterized it. And in a sense, I call it the cosmic wiggle. You know, <laughs> Terence called this the cosmic giggle and concrescence into novelty and all that Terence type of language. Right. But I wanted to characterize it st- statistically and mathematically, and that's what I did for my PhD. But the but one night, this or one morning, this lucid dream of me approaching this this huge molecular storm, and it was kind of like a grown-up version of the of the molecule I saw when I was fourteen. Wow! And I pushed into it, and I I said, "This is where the secret is hidden. The secret of the origin is hidden." And I pushed into it, and suddenly, you know, it was all around me, and it started to laugh, and it 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 throbbed and flowed around, and it was heaving me around and laughing and it said i will not give you my secret so easily wow especially with your puny machine your puny box and i look down and there's this black box in my hand and it represents you know computing technology sure whatever I, kind of measuring instrument you you yeah, at the time sure yeah and it's like you're pu- you think you can you know divest me of my secret with your puny your pathetic box and and i realized that was a that was a message uh from what my challenger in a sense 
and I switched. You know, by, by the time I defended my thesis, I realized that to crack this problem of the origin of life, we have to build, computers are way too underpowered, and they actually have the wrong physics, even. Hmm. They're, they're not, you know, there will never be a singularity. Then there's, there's barely any emergent phenomena in computing systems. You know, they're, they're really, really poor environments for a lot of things. What about so, the what about the hope of like biological computing systems of organic computing? Is, does that hold any promise? Well, I mean, there's fundamental problems. Uh, I think we're probably a century away yeah. from from building authentically like what von Neumann thought computing could be. Mm -hmm. um, I've studied this pretty deeply. I've, I've collected probably thirty tons of computing hardware. In the DigiBarn. Uh, in, in the DigiBarn, and interviewed 500 people, and wow. I have all wow. of the documented history from systems from mechanical systems from 100 years ago, all the way through the ARPANET and personal computing and whatnot. So I, you know, I I, I went through this, and I went to the Institute for Advanced Study, where I, I go now and then to talk to Pete Hutt and Freeman Dyson. Mm. Uh, mm. Fre Freeman's been very helpful with our origin of life work because it's something he's been interested in for 50 years. Yeah, um, absolutely. One day I went in, with their permission, I went into the archives of John von Neumann um, and Robert Oppenheimer and looked through all the papers on the first modern computer that was built at, in Princeton 1952 wow. by John von Neumann. Mm. And there's a, there's a note there uh, which says the print the, the computer the, the electronic computer we built at Princeton must be understood as a contingency architecture such that we don't have to use external patch cords and we can run real programs and do some actual work but the architecture is is in no way the best way to do it especially with regard to natural systems wow and he, he already realized that the, the von Neumann bottleneck, as it's called now, would, would hamstring future research and to try to model living systems mm -hmm. or, or natural systems or physics. And, it, you know, computational architectures are woefully set up for that. You know, there, there's so many compromises. So I'm, I'm not a believer in AI of any kind or you know, strong or weak, you know, it's because the architecture of computing is so crystalline and fragile and friable and, uh, you know, really difficult to, to work with. So what do you think? I, I mean, I was actually about to ask you a different question, but then what do you think when, you know, I, I read about guys like, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk saying that, you know, within 10 years, we're going to have some AI revolution that's going to threaten humanity. And I don't know what they mean by that. And you're saying, you're not on board with that. No, I mean these these are people without deep knowledge in these areas. Mm. So so for example, one of these guys is Ray Kurzweil. Yeah. And uh, about 15 years ago, Ray hired me to uh, generate the numbers for his book on the singularity. Mm. And I said to him, I will because of the DigiBarn collection, yeah. I'll generate numbers for not CPUs, but GPUs, because CPUs are mostly not used in model, modern computers. They're sometimes at, you know, 2% utilization. But GPUs are hard-driven little buggers, <laughs> you know, graphics processing yeah. units that drive game boards and stuff. So I generated these spreadsheets for him, showing sort of a nonlinear growth curve of GPU speed. And I, I, I attach an essay saying, Ray, you cannot interpret this to uh, make an argument for what you're making, which is that self-awareness or self, even self-organization is going to occur in software hmm. because hmm. of the increasing speed of the chips. It, it, there's no connection. And in fact, we're getting worse at doing software we're, because we're piled, piling on with legacy code. And about the same time... So uh, Leisure Sue Larry was the most self-aware program ever written, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. Or Microsoft Bob. Right. I don't know. But um, we're, we're old enough to know what that is. Remember that? But, <laughs> but, you know, in truth, Ray doesn't have scientific training, and he's not even really a, a good technologist. I mean, he's he doesn't uh, 
have sort of objective critical thinking skills. He's mm. a popularizer. He's kind of a, you know, under the big top kind of a guy. And wow. it doesn't have understanding of biology that even, you know. So so you you have to take the pronouncements of these people with a grain of salt because they they're not working in this area. And they're not they they lack an understanding of how, say, evolution works. You know, the hard problems. I mean, the hard problem of the origin of life. I mean, you know, by by studying this and developing a model for this, working with David Deemer at UCSC, we have learned, and then, you know, and trying to do it in the lab, and then trying to do it at humeral events in volcanic fields, you know, out in the field, we've learned how hard it was for things to self-organize and go through phases of increasing complexity, you know, even with the planet-based computer, you know, this this was non-trivial. It took a long time for the systems to emerge and, and be refined. I want to actually get into that with you in a minute, but just a couple of more questions uh, before we get to that. Oh, uh, it's interesting to me why you weren't at Burning Man this year. I'm sensing a, a disturbance in the burner force. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it it just I just got overloaded. Yeah, uh, I I did a. A big show to a show and a talk at the Lightning in the Bottle Festival, mm-hmm. and then last year I did a tour of Australia. And I, you know, I'm probably going to another festival in September, and and I, I look at Burning Man as kind of, it's kind of in decline. You know, it's there's enough challenges. It's sort of in late middle age, and we're in late middle age yeah, probably. Yeah. I, I'm not necessarily in decline, but there's there's a lot of things that just don't work very well there Mm -hmm. um and you know the party scene and you know paris hilton going yeah yeah (laughs) that's not a positive thing right (laughs) because that's the nonsense culture coming into something that was really kind of a pure and exciting thing so you know we we love our billionaires there because they build the best beautiful stages and structures and stuff but They've walled off their condos with with million dollar black class A motorhomes, mm-hmm. you know, and you know it's it's balkanized in a way. And I I went during sort of the the glory. Galen and I both went during the glory years in some ways, and helped start the first speaker series there uh, with Lorenzo Haggerty, the Palenque Norte, which is still going. No kidding. Uh, and. That's an incredible speaker series, and and so I would go to Burning Man when there was good tents full of places to go and do a talk or do something with a live band or whatever. And there, the last year I went, it was really really poor. It was uh, there wasn't good support apart from our camp uh, for speakers. So, you know, I love to ride my bike around and wear my fake dreadlocks and all that, but I I, I need to. <laughs> Do, have a purpose, you know, go and go there and meet people and do these talks. You, uh, you talk, I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, the, your performance moniker, the science plus vision equals hope, but uh, this ties in a little bit to something you were saying a second ago and something I actually heard you say on, on Duncan's show about, uh, Terrence talking about the balkanization of epistemology. And I want to ask you a bit about this and then we can get into, um, some of the origins of life stuff. Before we go to break, but there's a there's a, a, a an, another mystic, a, a Benedictine monk named David Stendel Ross. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but yeah, he he actually spoke at Esalen. Uh, I, I wanted to see him actually, and I wasn't able to get down there. He's something else, man. And he uh, one of the things he talks about is the the spiritual life is this kind of dance between two poles of belonging and longing. That there are times when when one experiences this kind of separation from the whole because that that's when they need to go internal and do introspection and do analysis of the of the part but then that's always done with the intention of reintegration back into the larger picture and there, there's so much there that that's interesting to me um, when you know when you said balkanization when you were talking about the camp the camp you know a burning man i was thinking about you know terence's comment about the balkanization of epistemology and really what's happened in the university since the middle ages even the concept of a university was supposed to be within the diversity of the various disciplines. Knowledge eventually pipes back towards itself and, and, and reunifies. But I think uh, we've over-specialized and lost that to a great extent. So I wonder if you can speak to that a, a little bit about the, you know, you're a guy whose ideas you know, bounce across a lot of different 
modalities. And so I've, I've heard you talk about submitting things to NASA and other places and having them kind of scratch their head because the ideas are kind of new and they don't know what to do with them. So how, you know, how have your, your, your things been received by traditional academia? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> rolling the clock forward or back, James Lovelock's new book, which I think is called Rough Ride to the Future. Yeah. Uh, there's a wonderful chapter in there about the life of a gentleman scientist hmm. and, and how he was really outside of structures and independent in, I think, his farm in Devon. And he would make, make his own instruments and fund his own expeditions and whatnot and then huh. show up at the meetings. But uh, he was kind of accepted and not not accepted, but eventually he made a major change in several fields. And um, Dave Deemer and I, we kind of look at each other a couple of years ago and said, you know, we're gentlemen scientists. We're we're Dave is he's not retired, but he's a research professor at UC Santa Cruz, and he's got a lab and everything, but he doesn't have uh, teaching responsibilities, and he doesn't have to fundraise. And I'm kind of an independent thinker, you know, with my lab in a trailer here <laughs> and uh, my little farm here. And we're gentlemen scientists. We're wow. in the mode of Charles Darwin. And I, I took my trip on the Beagle last year and this year by going to the Pilbara in Western Australia to work with geologists and break open these three and a half billion year old stromatolytic rocks. And yeah. so I, oh, go I, ahead. I, yeah, and so... So definitely, and, and then you have the challenge, of course, of the academy of, of presenting revolutionary or paradigm-shifting ideas to the academy, and that's, that's a whole social engineering project. So my, my particular ability or that I've developed over the last 30 years is to change my skin. Hmm. So I put, hmm. I put on the tweed jacket, you know, and I, I go to the meeting of origin of life chemists in Galveston. Uh, and I have internalized their culture enough, you know, through my training in ethnography, actually in college, uh, that I use all of the right terms and et cetera, et cetera. But I'm an outsider, but they think of me as an insider, partly because I come along with Dave and Dave is a renowned figure. So I'm kind of a you know, Dave's my mentor, but Dave and I co-authored the papers, and we, we, we literally had monthly or weekly talks for five years to to sat down and figure this thing out. That's but really interesting. Right. Oh, go ahead. It's it's a challenge to then bring these ideas to that are potentially quite disruptive and transformative to a field where you've got top rated. You know, you have Nobelists. And and gradually making the case, and that's actually happening right now. There's been two articles in the New York Times this summer uh, on the transition of science from an ocean-based origin of life to back to fresh water on land, which is what we're we're promoting. And this this fight, debate, dispute has erupted in the New York Times. Hmm. So, so it's happening right now in front of us. And our theory was published last year in the, the second part of it in May. And uh, we actually just prepared an op-ed for the New York Times. So, so we're in the middle of the fray right now on this thing. And it's a, it's a revolution in science. So it is possible to come and you know, shift an agency like NASA to new goals in space and to shift a field like the origin of life uh, with, with careful, you know, well-timed and well-thought-through and well-versed uh, arguments. You know, it's interesting you say that. I, I want to get into in a minute here um, a couple of things. I want to start with your origins of life model and get into that in a second. But something you just said that was fascinating. When I've been looking at your work and from what I know of, of you from afar, um, I've, I've seen you as this kind of, you know, I, you know, there's not a scientific or a philosophical apple cart that you haven't uh, been, been totally gleeful to flip over <laughs> in your career. Um, you know, do you know Thomas Kuhn and the structure of scientific revolutions, that book? One of my favorite books in college. Yeah, I see you as a guy kind of coming in that trajectory that are looking at these tipping points in, um, in some of these massive um, uh, trajectories, these epistemological sort of, uh, um, what am I looking, what's the word I'm looking for? The underpinnings of our, of our knowledge and civilization and saying, wait a second, are we sure 
that the way we know and what we know is correct. Um, and I see you as a kind of perpetual outsider, but what, but then I've heard you talk about this a lot in that kind of argument you had with Terrence when he was saying, stay away from culture, it's demonic. And you were saying, no, integrate as much as, as of it, of, uh, integrate as much of it as you can. And so it's not so much that you're a, an outsider as it is that you're an insider in a lot of different groups. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I call this a form of shamanism. Yeah. And, and so I've, I've been in military think tanks, you know, NASA high-level meetings. You wear a logo shirt for those. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> you, you're working with shamans in, in the Amazon. That's a whole different outfit and a op- cultural operating system. Or working in Pakistan, we, we have a, a part of a company. We have a team of 300 people in, in Islamabad. And that's a whole different scene there, you know, and but you just adapt, you know, it helps in a, some sense being Canadian because Canadians are, they, they le- have less of a nationalist sense to hold on to and they're, they're more inclusive. And so Canadians abroad are very good at re reskinning themselves and just adapting. And, and so, you know, that's part of our, our national training, I think. <laughs> Well, you're good at it, man. Um, I heard you. I want to ask you this question, and then maybe we'll go to break and come back and dive into the the origins of life stuff. And then also I want to ask you about your work in space exploration. Um, But I heard you tell the story. So you told the story on this program um, about being a a young person in in Canada, actually, and walking around in the hills and, and having this question about about where life came from and how it started and that's been such a driving force in in your in your work and i heard you tell another story about walking the streets of prague and visiting the the alchemist quarters and you're we talked about it already in this program the mystics and the alchemist and their obsession with not not turning uh, lead into gold but with with giving life to the dead or reanimating uh, inanimate matter and and uh, another way to look at that you know I mean this Frankenstein modality but another way to look at that is really trying to recreate or understand that moment when when um, inanimate matter uh, became alive and took on life for the first time and I'm wondering you know was that another uh, this is these those two moments really have been things that have driven your work to the to date is that is that true yeah and and truthfully uh, sometimes I ask the question as I feel we're getting closer so in that seething molecular cloud hmm. because I didn't use the box I didn't use the computer I used the full power of you know the neuronal bundle in my brain case wow. to to tackle this problem and then absorbed an entire field and then met, met Dave Deemer and was trained and built on his 50 years of work and things like this, I think we're getting really close to the center of that thing of how life began. And as I get closer to it, I can almost feel its heat. No kidding. And it's, 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 it's an, a quickening game, in a sense. And one of the things that I asked it was, were we made by a chemical machine? Is that all there is? Where is spirit in this? Hmm. You know, where is spirit in this machine? And sometimes, and this is this is stuff I can't apply or talk about in science, but I see things. So one of the things that I saw in last November when I was posing this question was this twisting and untwisting thing that looked like a rib cage when I asked the question. And out coming coming out from the rib cage was this spire of light. Hmm. That would go on and off and on and off as this thing twisted and untwisted. And then, literally days later, I had a thought experiment just came to me like a thunderbolt that this is a double helical molecule and that we could have had double helical molecules like DNA at the very beginning. And then suddenly in a flash unrolled the entire structure of how short pieces of a DNA-like molecule could have emerged in the beginning and unwound just through the application of hot water. Wow. And then express themselves all through physical self-assembly, and we could have had the entire pattern of what life is chemically through self-assembly by chance. So 
what was interesting to me at that point was what was the spire of light then? You know, I mm. could understand that the rib cage thing was like the breath of life starting. Sure. The sure. winding and unwinding, winding and unwinding, which is the whole basis of our model is cycling. But there was a spire of light. So that's that's just basically saying, you know, there's still something in here that's more than just a machine. The ghost of the machine, yeah, the illumination part. So what do you have an answer for that? I, I don't. Um, it, it, it's almost as though, you know, in another experience several years ago, uh, I saw these fingers moving, little fingers just before the first cell division. So I was doing the, the thought experiment on how did the first cell divide? Hmm. And in order to, to do that, I was, you know, in a very, very peaked meditative state because I was seeing hundreds of things going at once. I I'd actually become that, that cell uh, in order to do this. You wow. sort of have to throw your entire self into it. And I'd become that cell and I was dividing and I saw fingers moving in this kind of rhythmic sequence. And that was four years ago. And it, it's taken until now to realize what that was, you know, that that was sh these short, what are called oligos of genetic information that lined up by chance and were then sequenced just good enough so that they could make copies into the other, into the daughter cell it was about to divide off. But I still don't have the full understanding of the mechanics of that. You know, that's still probably several years in the future. Because um, that's just another part of the story of the origin of life, the, the first cell division. Um, I want to ask you before we go to break uh, about just to circle back to your performing title, Science Plus Vision Equals Hope. Because so what I dig about so much of what you do is it seems on the surface to be in these different areas, but it all connects back in your work on origin of life and space travel connect really nicely. And maybe we can talk about that in the second segment. But you know, the science you're doing and then that pillar of light is where the vision comes in and maybe is maybe the hope part is that, you know, that illumination doing the science going into those liminal states back and forth between those two modes it just keeps bringing you deeper into the mystery. It, it really does. And, you know, it's one of the, the beautiful, most beautiful things that came out of the last year's work was this realization in a flash that we, that our ancestors quite possibly were a communal unit. Hmm. They, were, they weren't individual competing cells. They were little protocells, very fragile, only able to do one or two jobs. And they were networked together. They were enjoindered in the common enterprise of self-protection and nutrition. And we've given this a name, which is the progenote. Uh, which was predicted by Carl Woese, the novelist uh, who found the, art, the third branch of life. He predicted that, that the beginning of life would be something called a progenote, but he didn't have a chemical model for it, and now we do. And here's how it, the, the flash came, which was that if we started as a communal unit, a collaborative system, hmm. you can rethink all of of, of life on Earth and human civilization and cultures, and you can re-see it through that telescope that, in fact, life began as a cooperative unit, and it still is. Yeah, complexity theory, systems theory. Howard Bloom and I were talking about planetary mind. I've heard you use the phrase endosymbiosis. Yeah, yeah, and... and it's a really powerful message there. And, in fact, if we can show that life began on land in fresh water... That means that the land was continuously inhabited. It wasn't a dead place for three billion years. Wow. That means uh, basically fungi and sort of mycelial structure is probably a lot older. That soils, soils and microbial mass are truly ancient and they're the continuum. And so what we sit on on land, uh, redwood trees, are simply the same structure that I saw in my mind's eye in Australia last year grown up. Wow. And the, it's still a communal unit, and the redwood is just a giant expression of, it, it's one system, there is only one system. Um, and, and it could unify all of biology, it can unify the physics of complexity science and Stuart Kaufman's ideas, it could unify 
philosophy and technology, this one idea. And, and in our lifetimes, we should be able to see this happening in the lab chemically, because I made seven testable predictions in the essay, and each one of them is, is doable without costly uh, chemistry or reagents. It's doable just by building fairly simple equipment. That's so a, it, it's a challenge for the postdocs. <laughs> well, let's go to break, and then I actually want to ask you about that model when we get back. Sound good to you? Perfect, yep. All right, folks, you're listening to On the Block Radio. Our guest is Dr. Bruce Damer, and we will be right back after these words. Thank you for listening to On The Block. We talk to smart people so you don't have to. We'll be back in a moment. In the 50s and 60s, I seem to remember... Computers were the size of this rock. Then they became the, the size of this rock. They were used for boring things like planning nuclear strikes. And then they became used for interesting things like games and emails. You ask me, how did that happen? Because... Now, there were two things that caused the computer revolution. One was the invention of the microchip. Ta-da! The old computers had been so huge because all their insides were full of thousands of sort of cables and valves and, and stuff. Once the microchip arrived, all these valves and thingamajigs could be shrunk to the size of a peanut. Computers could now shrink too. But what could we do with smaller computers? Well, that's where Star Trek came in. Small, easy-to-use computers were everywhere in the Enterprise. Do you see where I'm going with this? of Boulder Creek that lies above the mountains of the high-tech world of Silicon Valley in Northern California. Now, it may look like an average town, but Boulder Creek has one of the most remarkable museums in the world. To find out more, we need to speak to this man, Bruce Stammer. Now, Bruce is just an average country boy. He likes nothing more than tending his livestock, hanging out in the homestead, and dressing like Shakespeare. Now, he may have an interesting dress sense, but Bruce is one of the world's foremost experts in the history of computing. And it's not more pigs he keeps in that bar. Bruce has spent more than 10 years building a collection of computers that span the entire history of the machine's development, from $20 million supercomputers through the rapid development of the personal computers we take for granted today. Reflecting the progress of the biggest beasts in today's industry, and some of the ideas that became extinct. This collection got so big that Bruce has turned his shed into a museum called the Digibar. Hmm, so where did Bruce's love of computers come from? I'll give you one guess. That's right, back in the 60s, Star Trek was telling the world that one day, computers would be multi-purpose, everyday tools. Computed and recorded, dear. With which we might all constantly interact. Computer, you will not address me in that manner. The sexy technological innovation of the USS Enterprise had seduced the young Bruce Dammer and a generation of computer nerds. When I was a kid, my brother and I used to lie in our bed and watch Star Trek. One of the things we always noticed, and that I always noticed, was Spock, whenever there was something to really be understood, he would go on the bridge over to a console that had like a hooded screen and look in and blue light would shine on his face. Oxygen, nitrogen, atmosphere, suitable for human life support. And I always wondered, what is this guy seeing on this screen? While Spock was staring into his mysterious database portal, the rest of the crew could be seen using user-friendly computers in every aspect of their lives. A revolutionary idea that would change everything. 
So all the geeks in the 60s are growing up saw that and said, we got to make that real in the 70s. And they did. But it wouldn't happen overnight. Star Trek may have shown early computer pioneers what the future might be, but it didn't tell them how to get there. This would take some experimentation. The first attempt came in 1974 with a whopping great blue box that is widely seen as the first ever personal computer. But it's not quite the PC we take for granted today. It came as a highly intricate build-it-yourself kit, and once you had finished soldering its circuit boards together, users would find that it didn't actually really do anything because software hadn't been invented yet. Yes, it wasn't perfect, but for thousands of would-be tech types, it was a start. And thanks to its Trek fan inventor, Ed Roberts, it had a somewhat familiar-sounding name. So here we have the, the Sputnik for the nerd generation. This is the Altair 8800, named after a solar system in Star Trek. And directly for Altair 6. Altair 6. I think I'm going to get spacesick. This became the focus of many homebrew and personal computer clubs. Kids trying to figure out how to make this thing useful. And a couple of those kids were Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, and their version of the Altair Useful was the Apple computer. And Bill Gates and, and his guys wrote BASIC, the, the language for this thing, and they created a company called Microsoft. So the modern world came out of this unassuming blue box. And the rest is Star Trek history. Armed with their Star Trek visions and very big brains, young enthusiasts like Bill Gates took what they had learned from fiddling around with Altair and set about bringing the personal computer into all of our lives. The guys went on to found Microsoft and Apple, Silicon Valley and the PC industry completely changing the whole world, making everyone rich beyond their wildest dreams. And, and, and what thanks do I get for inspiring all this? Where's my cut? I, I don't see it in my contract. Well, actually, we did get some credit. In 2000, another one of the computer world's nerd giants, Paul Allen, one of the world's richest men, opened a science fiction museum in Seattle. Pride of the place? My old captain's chair. He bought it on eBay for a reported 100,000 bucks. And it didn't stop there. Last year, his company, which really is called Vulcan Inc., helped finance the launch of his own version of the Enterprise, Spaceship One, the first ever privately funded craft to leave Earth's atmosphere. Now, it can't quite travel at warp speeds of a thousand times faster than light, like the Enterprise, but it's pretty cool. Incredible, isn't it? Star Trek transformed the lives of us all with all its incredible new scientific and engineering concepts. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, can I, can I, can I go now? Oh, there's more? Uh, sorry. But where did us Star Trek guys get this technological inspiration from? Did we study for years at the feet of Einstein? Did we have some kind of special foresight into the future? Or were we all just scientific geniuses? Well, no. Uh, the truth about how Star Trek came up with all this world-changing stuff is really quite simple. Made it all up. What was that, Bill? We made it all up. Are you happy now? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Back at Paramount Studios in Hollywood, we had next to no idea about science or technology. We just wanted to make a cool TV show. But one thing we did know was that if we were going to make people believe in Gene Roddenberry's idea of a better future for mankind, the stuff you guys saw on the TV had to look kind of convincing. Head of Star Trek's Making It All Up department was Gene Roddenberry's right-hand woman, head scriptwriter Dorothy Fontana. Gene Roddenberry had a vision of Star Trek going places that other science fiction shows weren't going. He wanted the technology to look futuristic, and not just sound futuristic. In the reality of our real world, we worked on electric typewriters. We didn't even have a really good copy machine until about halfway through the first season. 
we were dealing with our technology and trying to envision a world that where technology was far greater. And they envisioned some amazing things, like the most famous piece of Star Trek technology of all, the transporter. Surely this was the result of years of creative planning. Uh, not quite. In fact, like most of the stuff in the show, the transporter had been born out of necessity, deadlines, and a meager budget. The transporter was never meant to be in the beginning. We were going to have shuttlecraft, and the company in Phoenix, Arizona, making the big set plus the uh, smaller models didn't deliver on time. So there were at least six or seven episodes that uh, we would not have the shuttlecraft, and therefore we had to find a way to get on and off the ship. Faced with this dilemma, Gene Roddenberry came up with a cunning plan. I know, he said, let's just sort of uh, have them just uh, appear out of kind of nowhere or something. And hey, presto, the transporter was born. From its very first episode, Star Trek had attracted attention. I sat back and waited for the fan mail. And boy, did it come. The following week, we received the first bag of mail. And then after that, it became bags of mail, more and more and more. So by the end of the, about the first 13 episodes, we were having so much mail that we could not handle it in the office. Letters, a thousand letters, a hundred thousand letters, a million. We were getting very intelligent letters. They weren't all just, please send me a picture. H hang on, these letters weren't for me? There were people in the science community, people in the medical community. Someone wrote in to Gene Roddenberry and said, How do those sliding doors work? The answer was there were two big stagehands pulling them on either side of the doors. Sometimes the stagehands were slow on the cue, so the actors would have to bang right into the door because you had to walk at them with authority, like they were going to open. Despite the prehistoric behind-the-scenes technology, Star Trek's on-screen vision of the future seemed to be catching on. And now we were getting mail from the world of medicine. Stunned by the bits of cardboard and balsa wood, oh, sorry, I mean amazing surgical equipment in the Enterprise sick bay of Dr. McCoy. Come on, what happened? Here was a place where diagnosis and surgery was quick and painless and didn't even require a knife. No bleeding. It's a medical miracle. And it was this idea that would help inspire a medical revolution. Real medicine was, of course, a world away from Star Trek in the 1960s and 70s. Should have responded by now. Back then, the diagnosis of many serious illnesses in the human body would often involve messy and dangerous exploratory surgery. Now, through Star Trek, the medical community was offered a tantalizing glimpse of the future. Everyone, this is Kelly Carlin, an author of A Carlin Home Companion, and you are listening to On the Block Radio. All right, folks, welcome back to the show. This is your host, Andy Gerbich. Our guest is Dr. Bruce Damer. And when we left, we were just getting into your uh, work on origins of life. And um, I, this is called the, the coupled phases model. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I think that's better than the, the Damer Deemer model. <laughs> <laughs> Although people in the field are starting to call it the Damer Deemer thing. The Damer Deemer thing, nice. <laughs> so tell us what the, a little bit about the coupled phases model. I know that it centers around work. Uh, I don't know if you saw that recent Guardian article about they found some of these, uh, is it stromatolites? Yes. They found yes. some of these formations in Greenland and these in Greenland rocks that are 3.7 billion years old now. So that's about 220 million years earlier than the stuff in Western Australia. I, I was with one of the geologists who actually is the, the lead geologist of the Pilbara region in Western Australia in, uh, in July. And he, he sort of spilled the beans and said, look, 
there's an article coming out, and I, he, he was the fellow who looked at those rock textures and declared them to be stromatolites. Hmm. So um, it's still disputed, even within his own community. Uh, it's, it's disputed. But certainly when you go with this guy out into the field, it's just incredible how he can, what, what they call read the rock record. Mm -hmm. he, can, he can look at these weird looking textures and slumping and cones and domes and things like that and, and clasts. And he can sort of tell you the story of what was going on weather-wise and how these organisms were growing in mats and how a storm event pushed a bunch of them off and folded them up. You know, it's incredible to hear this. His name is Martin Van Cranendonk, hmm. and he's one of the co-authors of the the issue of Greenland uh, paper that just okay. came out. Okay. So basically, these are microbial mats. These are produced by the activity of microbes, and I've heard you talk about them. Uh, they, they can be found in uh, these saline lagoons in a few locations around the world, and I've heard you liken them to like a bathtub ring, something yeah, like this. Yeah. They're actually like the plaque on your teeth, too. I mean, microbial mats and microbial communities still dominate the planet. Mm. Like we, we're there at their at their uh, their graciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're uh, grazers on the microbial mat world. Uh, you know, they they tolerate us in a sense. <laughs> for, for now, by the way, <laughs> that might change. For now, uh, <laughs> but they totally dominate the biosphere, um, and. The way we think they began is the way that Darwin thought life could have begun, which is in a warm little pond. Hmm. And a freshwater warm little pond, not in the ocean, which is a violent place full of salts and everything just dissipates. Right. Uh, but if you have a little warm pond and if you're walking out, say, in a, a desert environment and you see one of these ponds that's like almost all dried up, you see all this stuff accumulating at the edges. Right. And in the ancient Earth, the stuff that would accumulate at the ancient edges was meteorite infall, little little meteorite particles that would have contained amino acids and lipids, the building blocks of, of uh, membranes, which are your cell walls, hmm. and nucleobases and other, other goodies were raining down on, on these parched sort of dry landscapes, which were fed by rainwater and vol volcanic, uh, bubbling volcanic fields. And so if you actually go to a bubbling volcanic field like Yellowstone or Bumpus Hell in, in California, it looks like a chemical lab. Yeah, definitely. You know, they're cycling, they're bubbling, there's different colors or different pHs, you know, acidic or uh, levels and things like this. And there's, there's things going on constantly over thousands of years. They're nature's chemistry set. And this is where we situate our origin of life. And that in order for anything to happen, you have to cycle it. So you, in, in our case, we have the pool drying down, a bathtub ring of, of dried out things forms on the edge, which includes a mixture of lipid membranes all collapsing down, kind of like a slurry, kind of like you know soap bubbles when they dry down to a flat sort of soapy... Uh, you oh, know, film, yeah. Things. Yeah. And in between those, those membranes are trapped your amino acids and your building blocks of nucleic acids. And it turns out that they line up in a two-dimensional layer and they go click, 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 and they form long polymers. Huh. And, and we're, we're doing this every day in the lab at UCSC now. You know, we, we can grow RNA up to 100 to 150 building blocks long in wow. less than a few hours we, just by drawing down the solutions. No kidding. It's an incredible discovery. It's a way that nature could have built, put together the building blocks of, say, peptides and proteins and nucleic acids, put them together without having active biology. It just did it by drying little ponds down. And, and then the miracle, if you, if you think of it as a miracle happens, the pond fills up again. And, and when it fills up again, and you can watch this under a microscope, the outer layers of these dried films bud off trillions of little vesicles, little containers. And in some of those containers are the long little RNA-like polymers or peptides that you just made. Hmm. They each hmm. have a random set. 
and it's like the roll of dice in a in a in a game of chance. And so but there's these trillions people, of them, yeah. Trillions of them, and so each bubble is a test, and the ones that stay around and the test, the 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 passing of the test is pretty simple. Don't pop, <laughs> you know. So so if you have a a peptide or a uh, you know a nucleic acid that somehow folds and makes makes something and does some kind of little process that lines the side of your inside of your bubble to make it more stable that means you're going to be around when the pond dries back down again hmm. and so that little cargo goes back gets dried down put back into the dry layers and it could be replicated and it can grab an, and it can grab another random tool Yes, and it can grab another random tool. And that's the metaphor I used in my TEDx talk on this was the Swiss Army knife. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and each of these tools is made by chance. And the, But when the tools start working, they start getting together. And then you have the body of the Swiss Army knife with all these great tools po- poking out. And that's the beginning of, you know, biology. And... So this is all doable in the lab. We, we've got up to the second or third stage. We're now growing these long polymers and trapping them in our little vesicles, our little protocells, we call them. And we're watching them dry down and come back up. And we're watching the length of all that stuff grow and grow. When I look to uh, some of the implications for this, because, um, you know, there's so, I mean, there's, there, there are so many things that pop out at me that I think are really interesting here. One of them we already talked about, which is this sort of collaborative, um, cooperation. These, um, I, I wouldn't use empathy, right? Because then we have to get into conscious systems, but these, this collaboration that, that existed, uh, in our early, early microbial ancestors. But the, the numbers we're looking at here are pretty amazing because if these, especially these new findings, but even from the stuff from Western Australia, I mean, that if, if this model holds together, then we're looking at life on Earth on dry land uh, continuously for about 3.5 or more billion years. Is that, is that correct? In, in fact, it's more breathtaking. Uh, with our model, <clears throat> here's one of the, the fun things about it. If, if you run the, the, the drying down and the refilling too slowly hmm. in our lab or out in the field, all of the long chain things you make break up because oh. if they're exposed to water, water is the universal solvent we're always told when we're little kids, right? Sure. Um, and it breaks everything up. So therefore, an origin of life, even just getting to that first progenote phase, has to happen quickly. Hmm. It's not. It's not millions of years. It's probably once the conditions in a, in a cycling pool or system of pools is is correct. Once you're inside that box, that magic harmonic, yeah, you're you're going to get that system emerge quickly. No so kidding. one of the arguments is that the oceans existed perhaps at 4.2 billion years ago. There would have been volcanic islands everywhere, and as long as there's hydrothermal spring systems and there's rainfall. Uh, you could have had the setup for the beginning of life as far back as that. This this is an amazing. I mean, a couple of things about this blow my mind. One, I've heard you say, and others that this is the first complete kind of stem to stern model for the origins of life that 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 is out there. Is that correct? That looks like it might fly. That that is correct. It really is. That's exciting, first, and it's testable. Uh, it's exciting for us. It it it, it came almost. Dave and I still can't believe that we're sort of sitting in the middle of all this at the moment. <laughs> but it, it came through collaboration. Yeah, you know, isn't I, that? Well, of I course. Have, neither of us could have done this on our own. That's kind of a that, that's kind of a, a, an interesting metaphor there because the the work you're doing is so much about the origins of life being collaborative. The this discovery, I think, also raises questions about the possibility of life on other planets. Because uh, I mean, if three point seven, three point five billion years ago. Um, Mars was was wet then, right? And if and if the implications are if life can form that early in that early of geologic history of this planet, um, then it doesn't seem to need complex or specific conditions to evolve. I think some of the earlier models was that the planet was far too hostile back then to support any living thing whatsoever. And your model is showing that that might not be the case. And so that has profound implications, not only for the possibility of life around the rest of the universe, but I guess the possibility for us to survive 
uh, in the different conditions in the rest of the universe and adapt to them, you know, through the use of technology as we head out into them. Is that correct? Yeah, and in, in fact, um, of course, it's kind of like Goldilocks coming to the house and finding the different bowls of porridge. Sure. You know? uh, poor old Venus was just too close to the sun and its oceans that it would possibly have had boiled off. Mm. It went into hothouse hell and it's been there ever since. Right. And poor old Mars <clears throat> just got too cold, didn't have a, an iron core, so it didn't have a magnetic field protecting it from blow off from solar wind taking all of its atmosphere or a lot of its atmosphere with it. And so if life started in, in those environments, in, in Mars now it's underground because of the radiation and this, the desiccation and in Venus it probably is nowhere, you know. Mm. And, and so what's what's chilling about all that is that, you know, Earth with its oversized moon and its you know, that the chance of, of complex life emerging is probably so, uh, so rare in, in the universe, just let alone microbial life having a good ride for three billion years and being able to transform its world, you know. You know, that brings me to a question about uh, your work in space travel, you know, and it blows, it blows me away. You know, you're this little kid walking around the hills in Canada working on the origins of life. And, and then, uh, as I've heard you explain it, you saw the moon landing and and kind of lost your mind you started drawing asteroid capture missions on scratch paper and sending them to nasa <laughs> and they would write yeah. you back kind of like uh who is this weird canadian kid sending us these things on cocktail napkins uh and then now 20 something years later you're working with them doing modeling of all of their missions uh and then i want to if you can tell us a little bit about these shepherd miner pods i think yeah, this is a fascinating the, idea go ahead the shepherd came about when you know i started working on you know how how do you extend life off the planet mm -hmm. because of course you know human civilization uh, is a very hungry entity a hungry biological entity and it shows like no uh, signs of uh, its hunger lapsing right so so it, it it's it's just a powerful force that needs to expand so we need more area to expand into but what we're, we're doing is we're carrying biology out of the gravity well right and a after four billion years of evolution or thereabouts perhaps we are gaia's reproductive organs hmm. so i always had this concept you know back in the 70s I, I i thought of drawing a big peace sign in the hillside next to our house to sort of make a statement but then i thought you know that wouldn't that would just get blown away in a few days and wouldn't really do anything. What if what if I could try to figure out the bigger picture, you know, rather than worrying about the details of, you know, climate change or or the weird psychology that humans are prey to and all yeah. those, those are hard problems to solve. Just figure out how to give us more living room and more resources so that we can continue. Uh, we don't hit a huge stumbling block, hmm. you know. We don't get into the crowded cities of Europe of of the uh, 1600s such that we're prey to a plague, you know. Right. Uh, we, we have a place to expand to. So I, I thought, okay, the, the Earth is a womb, but it's also a tomb. You know, within a few hundred million years, there is going to be, uh, you know, there's a heating curve the sun's going through, and we're going to go to runaway greenhouse no matter what. Right. We're going to go the way of Venus because the Terminator approaches from Venus to us. <laughs> yeah, and so we're, regardless of what we do, or we're, no matter we're, how much we recycle, <laughs> yeah, no matter how be, much yeah. we recycle. So uh, the prerogative for us is to ensure a future pathway for complex life, given that it's so precious and rare. So I've been working on this problem since high school, and I realized it's asteroids and, and comets or icy planetesimals that are the key because they're the building blocks of life still are mm -hmm. there's trillions of them and you have to figure out how to use them and then one night i was standing with my lunar mining engineer friend out at nasa ames and i looked up and there was a flashing light on the top of hangar one which is an airship hangar and i had been arguing all day with my friend that you can't go and mine the moon it's too dry but heating and cooling and it's just a ridiculous place to try to go get water you know 
And uh, I said to him, Brad, that flashing light, if that was a comet captured in the Earth-Moon system and it was orbiting and it had a tail and it was sort of blowing off its volatiles, what do you think about that? He said, without hesitation, that would be the most valuable real estate in the solar system. Hmm. Every spacefaring nation would be trying to get control of that. And, and, and because it would contain 100,000 tons of water ice, and we, it would change the economics of space. It would allow us to go out because we could make fueling stations and we could, you know, it would be huge. And then wow. I said to him, why don't we learn how to go and get those things? <laughs> Seems yeah, simple, you know, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, like it's a no-brainer. So for years, I, I worked on this sort of on my own, and then our NASA funding dried up. And I was invited down to a meeting with uh, General Pete Warden down at our center, and it kind of rekindled my interest in that. And I realized they hadn't made any progress in, in many years mm -hmm. about stuff, but it gave us this, this idea to extend a fabric bag around, say, a, a small planetesimal, you know, you're talking something maybe a thousand tons that has water ice in it. And I had this idea to then you know, heat, uh, introduce some gas and then heat the gas and then the water ice would start to to boil off and you'd collect it and then you could collect all this, this condensed water in your tanks. And and I met this fellow at a conference named Peter Janiskins and I showed him the CAD models on my phone and he looked at them and he said, that'll never work. <laughs> And I thought, uh oh, you know, this is a space yeah, conference. Killing my, know. killing my swerve here, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who this guy is. And I said, who are you? And he said, I'm Peter Janiskins. I'm a meteor astronomer at the SETI Institute. Hmm. If there's a fireball seen in the sky anywhere on the planet, my phone rings and we go pick up the pieces. And I thought, uh oh, he's he's an authority. <laughs> yeah, he's, right. He's just popped my balloon. Uh, so we decided so to, speak. to go. Out. Yeah, and we we went out to have a, a lunch at a fish market restaurant, had a bowl of clam chowder, and then at the end of the bowl of clam chowder, he looked at me and said, "I figured out how to make it work." No kidding. So, so then we uh, we partnered with a third person, the world's leading balloon designer, Julian Knott, who designs all those high altitude balloons mm -hmm. that people jump out of. Yeah. Um, and together in five weeks, we came up with Shepard, which is this breathtakingly new idea to introduce the age of sail into space in that we come up to our asteroid, we, we take our balloon around it, we leave a lot of space between the asteroid and the balloon, but we, we enclose it with the balloon, we seal the end just as you would with a rubber band, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then we put our gas in and it turns out we never have to touch the asteroid. They're rubble piles anyway, they'll just come apart. You can't wrap cables around these things. Right. Do anything. And it turns out that if you do the, the math, uh, just the friction of the gas against the rotating asteroid, they're all tumblers, by the yeah. way, uh, will stop its rotation in less than a day. No kidding. And, and, and then we, we, we press waves of gas into the balloon from one end uh, up to about one newton's driving force and we can rotate the asteroid in in the balloon and then start driving it like a sailing ship and we can move them millions of miles so that that was the shepherd idea it was gentle handling of these planetesimals and then there's three variants of shepherd one is you know earth mover move it around get it to lunar orbit the next variant is turn up the temperature and pull off the water ice mm -hmm. and the methane and the CO2 and concentrate it in tanks and build a huge fueling depot for Elon Musk to fuel his ships before he goes to Mars. Right. And then there's another version which is using uh, carbon monoxide gas to pull nickel out of a, a nickel iron asteroid and plate 3D parts in space, huge parts, trusses and beams and you know, tank block sections and everything using the so-called MOND process. Uh, it's 3D printing in space. We can build parts of large space stations. So I was going to say the Werner von Braun uh, space station could be a reality and you could actually it, mine the parts can, in space and build them there. 
you could do it. With and 3D then printing. The, thir- the third variant's my favorite because I came up with it, I guess. <laughs> which is don't quite melt your icy rock. Let it stay in a liquid globule inside your, your balloon and inoculate it with life. And you'll end up with one of those biospheres you can buy in the store, which is in a glass sphere, and there's shrimp in it and everything. And yeah. it, it doesn't have contact with the outside air, but it's been living for decades just with light. Uh, and you now have a giant biosphere, a world in space that you can use to, you can feed crews and you can support life with this kind of thing. That's so, true because, uh, I mean, you can then introduce, I mean, just like people did tens of thousands of years ago, fermentation, you can start playing with all of that, those kinds of things to create yeah, a lot of different colonies, yeah. Fish and shrimp and whatever and just basically suck it all in and, you know, put it, put it on the barbie, you know. And so, <laughs> Your space so, barbecue. <laughs> that's right. So in one fell swoop, <laughs> one invention, sort of the steam engine for space, we created one technology that's low tech. This is not rocket science, really. <laughs> Literally, uh, yeah. <laughs> that if it works, it can solve all the major problems needed to uh, support a, a big breakout of life. Uh, and and here's the irony, Andrew. When I look into the microscope and I see the the bubbles bursting off of our lipid bilayers by their trillions and then the, the testing going on and the mm-hmm. beginnings of life, perhaps. And if I could be around in 50 years or 100 years, and if Shepherd works as a technology, what you'll see coming off the Earth are thousands of bubbles that go out and encapsulate these little worlds and, and basically uh. provide us the, and, and, and select the worlds and provide us the ability to carry life into the solar system on a huge scale uh, and build large structures and go to planetary surfaces and, and basically give us that, that high tower perspective that we need. And, and it's the same technology, it's encapsulation. It, it'll look the same as the origin itself. The breakout into space will look like it. That's really remarkable. And to, to tie it back to your origin of life thing, that, that bubble pushing out to to uh, make a replica of itself it's almost as if the planet i think you said it is asking us to do that for for it to make a replica of itself i've heard you say that before through through these kinds of technologies yeah and you know otherwise you know what as kurt vonnegut asked your your literature Mm -hmm. uh, professor he once asked what are people for yeah I ask myself that on the way to work and back every day (laughs) when I'm sitting in traffic. And, you know, I mean, you know, I was going to ask you about the Drake equation. uh, equation. I have a few other questions for you, uh, a SETI question. Um, You know, this the Drake equation, this argument, uh, this probability argument used to arrive at this estimate of the number of active, communicative, uh, extraterrestrial civilizations. Um, I'm, you know, so far at least, and I know that there's lots of places to look, but we haven't, like, like you said, I mean, what, the one thing we know is at least it seems to be complex communicative life seems to be in short supply so far at least. And so whether or not we're the only folks uh, in the cosmos, um, we haven't found, or at least we, as far as we can tell, we haven't found anybody else yet. And um, and so your, your idea of us being the, the reproductive organs of Gaia, it might even be bigger than that. We might be the reproductive organs of, of, of the entire universe. Well, you know, it, it, it's chilling. You know, there's always these wonderful chilling things, uh, but it's also a little bit humorous. Mm-hmm. In that uh, five years ago, I did a talk at the SETI Institute uh, which ex- uh, in which I extended the Drake equation with four new terms. Okay. Uh, and I had to be very funny about it because Jack, uh, uh, Seth Shostak was there sitting, lying on the floor in my talk. And Seth Shostak is, uh, of course, the alien hunter. Okay. <laughs> and, and should be on your show for sure. Okay. Uh, he, he's wonderful. He's incredibly funny. I mean, his office is plastered with UFO puppets and models and aliens of all kinds. You know, because <laughs> you got to be. Yeah, you got to be funny about this because you know what a job to have um and he gets all kinds of people coming at him with different different things uh best defense is humor uh, yeah. but uh, best offense is humor sometimes too uh, <laughs> but the um 
So he's 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 lying on the floor looking up at me, and I bring up my four new terms on the Drake equation, which was, uh, okay, given that the civilization has has created advanced technology, here's the next term. Are they willing to fund visionary nerds? <laughs> <laughs> and the next term was, are they willing to fund visionary nerds for a long period of time? Uh, the third one was, if these ver visionary nerds want to boldly go and build craft to go and seek other civilizations and worlds, this is a very expensive proposition uh, with un uncertain uh, outcomes. You could get nothing back, yeah. Get, no get nothing back. And then the fourth term was, are they still around when you know the ships arrive back? Hmm. You know, and because of this, the ridiculous time scales and everything. Yeah, and and so it's it, you know, a, 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 a ET arriving in orbit and or coming down and sucking up Frito Lay trucks or something, right. whatever <laughs> happens, is is um, is so vanishingly rare, uh, you know, as to you know probably like. Are there one or two in this galaxy? You know mm -hmm. that, that even even just pondered the thought before their foreheads were cut off by you know their their potentate. You know, <laughs> 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 you, you know? mentioned this uh, humor. I, I had a friend call me once and invite me down to a bar. He said he was sitting with a friend who I should meet. Who he wanted me to bring on the show. Who was an amateur Bigfoot hunter. And so I, of course I ran down there. And my first question for the guy was, how does one become a professional Bigfoot hunter? <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> how does one show their wares? You know, how do, how do you get to the to that next level of Bigfoot hunter? And of course, he cracked up. But um, <laughs> do you uh, uh, speaking of study, do, uh, do you have any input on this? Uh, the story that's floating around about this uh, possible signal spikes that coming coming from the constellation Hercules about 95 light years from the Earth. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I sort of glanced over those stories. I kind of. I figure that until I see something carefully done in peer review literature, mm -hmm. it's not worth even looking at speculations and internet memes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not worth looking at it. And you know, it's like my friends who believe in chemtrails or the flat earth, you know, right. I, I say to them, well, would you want the pilot of your next transatlantic flight to believe in the flat earth? You know, Probably while not. <laughs> while he's laying down his chemtrails, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're entertaining. They're, it's all entertainment. You know, it's just a form of entertainment, but it's, you know, it's unfortunately, these, these memes distract a lot of potentially good minds that could be helping with the, what humanity needs. How are we doing at funding visionary nerds at the moment? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when I was down doing the Duncan Trussell show with Duncan Trussell, mm -hmm. his house literally, if you go around the corner, you can see JPL, Jet Propulsion, Jet Propulsion Lab. Labs. Yeah. And I said to him, Pasadena, you know, is ground central for visionary nerd funding, you know, in maybe in the galaxy, <laughs> because you've got, you know, Novellus running around in Trader Joe's. You've got, um, you know, JPL people up here and Caltech over there and, and wow. the place has a beautiful public library. It's an amazing community. Mm -hmm. and, but there aren't that many of them. I mean, it, you know, it's certainly 1% of Americans are working in science, I think. And then a, a tiny fraction of 1% are, are working in science that's not just laboratory technician work, you know. And, and so the, for, for thinkers... In, in science, doing gentleman type science, it's it's vanishingly small. I mean, yeah. there, there's there's so few people because, you know, if I was a grad student or a postdoc or a young like you with you're just about to hopefully receive your tenure, mm -hmm. you know, if I if I was working on a question like the origin of life and making these grand overarching theories and stuff, I would never get tenure. Yeah, that's true. No and, no way. No way, and I couldn't get funding, and I was—I'm not following the program. Right, and you're not re, re instigating status quo. It doesn't get worked on by most people. So, so as you pointed out earlier, you know, science is in severe danger of getting, you know, balkanized epistemologically and balkanized to death, and into, into these specialty uh, niches that just stifle creativity and creative minds just don't want to go in. 
into these button-down narrow specialties. And once the dominant paradigm gets established, especially with the kind of money that's involved, um, it becomes very difficult to, to turn the ship. Yeah. And, and we could literally run ourselves down and not be doing good science in, in 25 or 50 years. And, and, you know, when you look at countries like China, which is sort of a great hope because they put value in education and whatnot, mm-hmm. I, I think that probably, and I, I you know, venture a guess, that there's some pretty incredible and brilliant minds in, you know, Chinese gold, gold mining uh, gameplay or in universities doing these degrees and things. But I think that that society would be even less tolerant of kind of, you know, wiry haired out of the box, crazy thinking than, than ours. I think that the United States is uniquely positioned to do this kind of thing. This is why we have the Nobel prizes and why everyone comes here. Hmm. So if, if the United States can't, can't pull off, uh, these paradigm shifts and transformations and breakthroughs, it's hard to imagine uh, other societies really having the oomph to be able to do it. I want to ask you one last question about sciencey kinds of things and then just quickly about the, the archival work you do before we let you go. Uh, do you know much about these electromagnetic propulsion drives, the, the M drives as they're called? I, I kind of glanced at an article and, you know, Years ago, there was the, a lot of interest in Vasimir mm-hmm. drive technology, and I don't know. I I'm just I worked in optical computing in the '80s, and that never flew for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And you know, I just sort of look at these things, these exotic things, and say, you know what? It it doesn't look like it it can compete in with real simple propulsion systems. Yeah, I mean, because it's, so, it's sort of on the other end of the of the really simple and, and really sort of achievable things that you're talking about. I, I, I've been sort of reading about this. It's a propellantless propulsion system that means that the, technically the engine doesn't use fuel to cause a reaction. I guess that's, a, I mean, for our audience and for people like me, this is a simple way of understanding it. I guess it, you know, these reactionless drives without getting too much into it, it has something to do with bouncing microwaves around a tube. But I, I heard somewhere that, that, that a peer review paper was just, now I sound like Donald Trump. I heard somewhere, right? But a, that a peer review <laughs> paper was just accepted on this. But you're saying that the data is just not there for it yet. Well, you know, if you can get a really small measurable effect, you know, it's probably pretty cool. But s- scaling any of these things up into an industrial strength proven technology in less than 50 years i think none of these are candidates that's a good point you know if we can if we can bag a huge chunk of ice and lower the cost and the weight of launch vehicles you know elon is so amazing first stage flyback now and that's a huge cost savings and and, but if he can fuel on orbit my god you know it's just going to be Sky's the limit. I mean, or not the limit. I heard you talking about that in one of your talks here, because a lot of these Mars missions, because there was so much fuel involved in getting someone there, a lot of these these planned missions were one way missions, right? They're asking people to volunteer just for when you're going. Hey, I'm, who wants to go on a one way trip somewhere, man? That's gonna, yeah. it's, gonna, it's a complete drag. So I, I mean, I think a lot of future astronauts are going to uh, thank you for your model. I want to ask you a little bit before we let you go here, just um, about your work and friendship with Terrence McKenna. How did you guys meet? You know, that was pretty interesting. I I, um, I was involved in virtual worlds, and these were sort of spaces with avatars, and think of them as, you know, player game characters, like people talking into heads, and their voice would come out of a mouth, and mm. you'd move around a 3D space on your computer screen, not not VR. And this is all in the mid '90s. Yeah. And one, and one day, I was in a lab that had a, a 3D cave in it, and they were running one of our virtual worlds on there. And there was this floating head, and through it was coming this tinny voice of this very interesting sounding, very odd guy. Yeah. <laughs> and it turned out my friend was simply playing a Terrence McKenna cassette. Oh, nice. <laughs> into, into his microphone, and there was a crowd of people in this virtual world listening. And I said who is this guy? And he said, well, I'll introduce you. And so we started corresponding by email and struck up a friendship uh, of a sort. Uh, And then we struck up an intellectual kind of 
joustingmanship. And he came here to the house here, and I put him in front of that very same virtual world so he could use it himself. Yeah, I've seen the video of that. Yeah, and then we went to his house in Hawaii, and we did a virtual all-chemical powwow over his big satellite dish because he was getting really exhausted from all the travel he was mm. doing, and he wanted to see if he could actually address audiences in cyberspace and becomes the zone ghost of cyberspace. Uh. <laughs> and, and and we did it. And unfortunately, uh, we didn't know this, the, the he had a brain tumor that had been growing for years, you know, maybe decades, because he suffered from migraine headaches. Mm. And my sister died of, this, of a similar kind of brain tumor. Oh, my tumor. goodness. And Terrence came down with this terrible condition. He had a grand mal seizure, and he was rushed to the hospital. And and really, there was only ten months left. Uh, and so we kind of saw him out. So mm. we went back to Hawaii. We had a, a wonderful conference in Hawaii, and it was the goodbye conference for us. And I had a visionary experience. I had one of my what I call my endogenous trips. Where, yeah. You know, I'm not taking anything because I, you know, I. I just do this on the natch. Wow. And it was the last hour of saying goodbye to Terrence, and we were all lying on the floor in the conference hotel, and Terrence was sitting on the floor, and we were surrounding him, and we were allowed to, like, do anything we want, take a nap, send him healing prayers, say goodbye, you know, whatever. Um, and as soon as my head hit the carpet, I was in this green plane alone, I was in an endo vision. Wow. And I was a sphere, observing sphere, and Terrence was sitting uh, cross-legged in the center of this green plane. And there was no one else there. And I realized he couldn't he didn't notice me. He was just there. He was already crossed over somewhere. Wow. And then wow. I, I heard this whirring sound. It was like whir, whir, whir. And I looked up and there was this dot coming through this sort of crystal sky. And it, as it approached, it started to glisten. And I realized, and this is a metaphor from Terrence's virtual world, so I realized this is a Fabergé egg. Hmm. You know, and, and it's coming down, and I realized it was basically a taxi. It was, it was like a vehicle, and it had a curving glass windscreen, and it had an unseen driver, and a plush seat in the back. And it was picking and, him up. Yeah, and, and it, it hovered next to him. Terrence looked at it, unfolded himself, stepped into the back seat, and, and it started moving off, and I saw him light up. You know, he lighted a bomber, and then it, it just took him up and out through this crystal veil. And I was pretty shy about this, but I approached Terrence as we were leaving. You know, we took a picture together. There's a picture on, on the web of the two of us with Robert Venosa. And I said, Terrence, can I tell you what I saw? And he said, sure. So I related this, and he turned to me, and he said, and this is the last words he said, ever said to me, ah, the getaway car. <laughs> and years later, um, I literally sat bolt upright in bed, um, and I said to Terrence, Terrence, you left too soon. I'm bringing you back. Hmm. And I heard his voice in the room. And I started this obsessive project to reconstruct him. And uh, Lorenzo Haggerty and I, between us, and then the whole community supported it. We, we got all the cassette tapes from Ralph Abraham, the trialogues, you name it. Yeah. We digitized those suckers, and we reconstructed Terrence McKenna and put, him, put his voice back in the psychedelic salon. And his archives were destroyed by fire, his yeah. huge book collection. I've got some of the only documents left. And... Dennis has them too, and Dennis and I are often on podcasts and talking together, and we sometimes talk about Terrence, but but we rebuilt Terrence McKenna. And then in 2012, I, I did a three-part road show about the life of Terrence um, to kind of put a button on it and reveal some truths that the community needed to know about Terrence. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we did that, and it was a big release, and I feel like, you know, I feel his presence. You know, I, I feel I felt very sad that he left so soon because yeah. we were having great conversations. We were we, he proposed that we go on the road together. Oh, that would have been great. You know, it would have been great. And um, I was questioning his, you know, singularity ideas in 2012 and stuff like that. And 
Uh, so was Ralph. But um, right. I just had lunch with a Ralph Abraham yesterday. Really? He's got a new you book know? out or coming out, doesn't he? It's Hip Santa Cruz. It's inter interviews with all the uh, counterculture figures that help make the counterculture from around here who, who meet here about every two years. Here it was, at the Santa Cruz was where the, uh, the archive was where it was burned. Is that correct? It was actually in, or in, was in uh, Malibu. Down in Monterey, it was Monterey, the, okay. the Esalen office. But oh, Santa that's Cruz, right, that's right. It was that big fire, that's right. But Santa Cruz was where the first acid test was held, and, and the county of Santa Cruz dedicated a memorial bus stop <laughs> to the, the location of the first acid test uh, back in December of last year. And, you know, Santa Cruz is kind of progressive in that way. Yeah, no know? kidding. <laughs> So, you know, uh, you, you've been on with Dennis a lot because uh, it seems like his work dovetails a lot a lot with yours in terms of really trying to nail the science down on things. And so it's good to know that you two interact. Those Psychedelic yep. Salon, man, I, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this a lot, but uh, I was obviously aware of Ter Terrence. I didn't meet him and I never got to see him speak, but I was aware of him through his writing. Um, but that, those were the first time I ever heard his voice was when those first thing when those came on and I would listen to Lorenzo stuff all the time. So thank you for that. I'm sure there's a lot right. of us out here. Yeah, and, and, and we, the, the challenge we have, and you'll understand this from your study of alchemy, and Terrence understood this too, but Terrence was a spellcaster. Mm -hmm. He was a spellcaster, and he had the Irish twang and twinge and twinkle to do that. I mean, he, the storytelling thing was his primary, you know, gift. Mode yeah, and absolutely. Gift. absolutely. And so... He cast spells on people, and in some cases they were not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so in podcast number 316, Dennis and I and the community uh, removed the spell uh, because it was, getting, it was getting out of hand. I mean, you don't want young people doing what Terrence advised them to do. Seven you know? grams of uh, psilocybin in a dark yeah. room, yeah. You don't want that, and and it's the wrong message to say. I'm 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 so excited to meet Mr. and Mrs. Machine Elf. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and that was not good medicine, mm -hmm. and so we had to we had to do something, and we did it in in that podcast, and it created quite a quite a bump in the field. But in a sense, we also I think liberated Terrence from you know his godhead or whatever people were putting him up to, you know. But um, and, and it's a cautionary tale. I mean, you did you last question for you before we let you go? Did you have to do something similar? So, in, uh, see, in two thousand six, you became an agent for the estate of Tim Leary and uh, received his remaining books and news archive and collection. And I'm wondering if uh, if you had to do a similar thing with Tim's work. Um, you know, Tim. Here's the interesting thing, and we could do an entire podcast. Yeah, about I'd love Tim to have Leary. you back on to talk about him. Yeah, you know. I could get my head around Terence's life. I think I could internalize Terence somatically. Mm. I could put the skin on of Terence McKenna and be him momentarily. Mm. You know, that, that's part of my, my shamanic practice is to become another. Yeah. When I do the cultural. So I would load Terence's cultural operating system and see the world through his eyes and just uh. become him. Um, especially when I'm doing certain kinds of storytelling. I literally run the Terence program mm. now and then. Uh, but I'll tell you something, Tim Leary, you can't do that with, you know, Tim Leary's life was so complex yeah, and so full of contradictions and nuance and confusions and the vapor trails of glory and disaster uh. that there will never be. And there probably never should be another Tim Leary. I mean, his, it just, I mean, you can really, you could call him anything and it'd be true, <laughs> but he was a magical being. I mean, he was, uh, for those that knew him, and I never met him. You know, I, I signed a get well card for him when he was sick in, in 1996 before he died. I've, I've met many, many people who were very close to him, and I, by going through these these records, and I have some of it, the last of his ashes here, too. How did you and, become an agent for the estate if you didn't even know him? You know, at a, at a party in Santa Cruz, there was this wonderful, short, um, intelligent woman I was introduced to. It was Dennis Berry, and she looked at me with these sad eyes, 
she said, you know, I've been carrying Tim Leary's uh, archives, it's just 500 bo- banker's boxes hmm. for 15 years. I need help. Wow. And I, I just looked into her eyes and I said, I will help. You know, I've dealt with collections before. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just be moral support. And eventually, uh, you know, we, we tried several high net worth individuals and we tried to, we were going to honor what his will said, which is to, he needed value from this to give to his kids because yeah. he felt in some cases he wasn't a very good father. Uh, although he was a great father to Zach Leary. Yeah, I was going to ask if you've spoken to Zach about these. I, I have actually. Um, in fact, um, after our, uh, the New York Public Library decided, it was the eventual buyer, they decided not to take the books, the news archive, or personal effects. So one of the personal effects was one of Tim's wallets. Wow. And full of cards and like Blue Cross of California, Timothy Leary, you know. <laughs> I thought, you know, Timothy Leary is dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I opened the wallet and went through it, and there was a picture of Zach oh, when man. he was about eight. And so I got in touch with him. I said, guess what I found? And I, I mailed it to him. He said, thank you very much. That you know, is something else. And a lot. And, um, you know, I said, this has to come to you. I, this is... And there's actually, there's an album signed by Ringo Starr, and I think it's actually signed to Zach in the record collection. Oh, that's so, cool as well. But, but yeah, and but touching the material, I mean, there was a real power that happened in that period. And one of the things that Ralph Abraham is doing in these new books is talking about the psychedelic wave and how it transformed not only his field of mathematics, but the whole world was transformed in a very short period of time, very powerfully. Cataclysmically in some ways, but absolutely, yes, extremely powerfully. And then other forces sort of came and reasserted themselves, and in some sense the psychedelic wave is back, uh, working in different ways, but, you know, ayahuasca and things like that is having a powerful impact, you know. Well, it's just been great having you on the show, Bruce. Thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure, Andrew. Um, one of the things I want to say at the end here uh, for our audience is that this wonderful idea of the Shepherd Miner, um, you gave this idea away. I saw in your TED Talk that at the end of it, you, uh, you t- expressed to the audience that you and the other designers of this concept uh, were giving the concept up and, open, and putting it out there open source. And I guess lastly, if you could maybe speak to why you did that and, and why you see the need for these so-called, you know, the importance of these open source ideas and technologies uh, for, you know, for the good of our species and our planet. You know, Elon has this policy, too. They'll file patents, but they want other companies to make batteries. Mm -hmm. Um, And they they want this this open source ethos. They want innovation to be spurred because they want competition. Uh, I see. And, And so I sort of thought, you know, other companies in our field, in the space field, will file patent after patent after patent on kind of ridiculous ideas, and then they'll hold these patents up and say, well, it's patent pending, therefore we need to get a NIAC grant. And it's it's really nonsense. You know, if, if humanity's going to do something as bold as opening space and, you know, allowing the extension of the biosphere into the solar system, it's something that all of humanity does. It's not a company thing. It's not a you know, an individual, you know, oligarch deciding to do it, or a, a one government. It's, a, it's a, a human drive of the human enterprise. And so the best thing we could do is, you know, I work in patent infringements, one of the other things I do. So in that TEDx talk, I basically said, I declare at the end of this talk that this, we have now given away this invention into the public domain. Hmm. So that in fu- future litigation, uh, they will pull this TEDx talk, and basically, you won't be able to defend the claims in your patent oh, because I get it. it was clearly shown the the innovation clearly given away. Last question: Where do you get? I mean, every time I see you, uh, you know, giving a talk or in, or in in an interview, you got this giant smile on your face. You seem to kind of have joy bubbling out of you. And and for a science guy, for a guy that works in a lot of dry areas what 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 drives that joy what drives that bliss that seems to come out of you because it seems authentic well you know uh in 1991 i decided to stop watching tv (laughs) there you go (laughs) when i lived in prague you know we talked about walking through the streets of prague 
I couldn't understand the TV, so I said, this is time to stop and completely unhook from the narrative that's coming through the media. Because even then it was really toxic, toxic. and manipul manipulative. And, and so because I've done that, I, I haven't a clue. I mean, the entire Clinton presidency, the Bush presidency, and the Obama presidency, I saw not a single news conference. <laughs> the funny thing is you haven't missed much. <laughs> right. And so... <laughs> So what happened is by, complete, by unhooking, I'll occasionally glance at stories, but in a quiescent environment like a website here yeah. and there. But I won't subject myself to that incredibly intense, uh, destructive force of, you know, broadcast, broadcast media. Broadcast media, yeah. And, yeah. and so I went back to reading and thinking and the, the joy of conversation and time started moving sl more slowly and things started getting, the anxiety went away. You know, I still have my own internal demons, like sure, we all do. Sure. But it's like, wow, the whole world just opened up and just came, became better. And, and nowadays, I mean, I, I, can't act, I can't look at TV. There's, there's absolutely no way, unless it's like David Attenborough and Planet Earth 2. Right, that kind of stuff. We'll download or Marco Polo or Breaking Bad or whatever, but no commercials, no news broadcasts. I, hmm. I, I even turn off NPR. I just can't take all that worry and concern and, you know. It all, paralyzes you know, people, doesn't it? it yeah, and it, it's, it's a carrier wave. And we didn't used to have this as a species, and we really don't need it. I, mean, I think you could turn off, you could shut down 100% all of that, and it wouldn't impact the economy. It would, it would, we have a bounce in, in, in health of people if we shut all that off cold turkey. I and it doesn't provide any value. I saw someone talking recently about if we went back to thinking about our time as something that not we that we don't waste, but that we spend, uh, then we'll look at the things that we spend our time on and think about them and, and look at them in, in terms of the value they bring our lives. Right. So you spend an hour watching television or two hours or three hours, and that's time. It's literally the most valuable thing any of us have. And yeah, then you and think, you know, what did I get back? What are, what's my return on that investment? And, and the social media uh, empires have been trillion dollars of fortunes have been built in figuring out how to steal time from us, mm -hmm. you know, employee time, family time, whatever. <laughs> uh, but of course, there's there's a benefit. I mean, you're meeting your old school buddies you thought you'd never be in touch with again. Yeah, that's so, true. So so uh, you know, facilitating uh, conversations like this. Absolutely, and this this is truly the the birth of the golden age of the podcast. It's just breathtaking what's going on. Out Spectacular there. out there, yeah, it really is. Well, Bruce, you've been very very awesome for uh, spending some time with us, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Anything you want to add here at the end? Well, if you want to get in touch with me, and of course, Joe Rogan warned me about this. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You know, because of his, his particular listener audience. Um, active, and, yeah. And, and he was right. Uh, but I, you can get in touch with me through my website at damer.com, D-A-M-E-R.com. And there's links to the Levity Zone podcast, the TEDx Talks, and all the projects are just all there. And if you want to get involved or you need some mentorship, and I just spent an hour on a Skype call with a student from Regina, Canada, who wanted mentorship on Hmm. how to get into astrobiology and i'm very help happy to especially young people you know and, and if you've got questions about woo woo things i can perhaps help you not be so anxious about them and but whatever just get in touch that's really cool uh yeah you don't have to worry about it i mean rogan's got several million listeners but there's only like 11 stoners that listen to this show so i think you'll be safe uh, okay. and, <laughs> i'm kidding of and, course and the, the stoners, of course, their their conversations always end with the same sentence. Which what is? Were what were we just talking about? <laughs> That's been a terrifying thing for me as I've done this show, because it happens to me from time to time. I'll lose my train of thought right in the middle of talking to a guest. Uh, that's why I like to do the audio only interview so I can look look around at my notes constantly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you've been awesome, Bruce. We really appreciate it. Folks, you've been listening to On the Block Radio, and our guest has been Dr. Bruce Damer. And we will put all of that contact info on our website as well, so you can check out all the great stuff Bruce has going on at Damer.com. 
com. I could have read your entire bio, but that would have taken up the entire hour. So folks can uh, get over there and see all of the great stuff you've written, all the other projects you have going on, and uh, connect with you if they feel like that's something they want to do. All right, folks, you're listening to On the Block Radio, and we will see you on the other side. Hi, I'm Douglas Rushkoff, author of Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, and you're listening to On the Block Radio. love, beauty, truth, justice, which must become the driving force of every action, especially actions of resistance that we take. And it's extremely difficult now to break away from the mass because commercial culture, corporate culture, uh, has done a very effective job of making us all afraid, constantly afraid. And fear is, is dangerous because when you're made, of, made afraid, you become passive and you start thinking with another part of your brain. Uh, and I think that much of it is really the ability not to be afraid. That that capacity to say no, to be defiant, is the mark of a life that's actually lived as an individual, rather than lived as part of a herd, uh, as part of the mass. Life has got to be more than saying, how do I slot myself into the world that it currently is? Uh, It's got to be about something more powerful. In the end, when civilization is shaky and rocky, uh, truthfully, it is all the structures of the investment banks and the governmental agencies and the pulpits of religions, those are the things that are going to come crashing down because those are the things that are, are patently unsustainable. They don't feed people. And in the face of shock, they shatter. The people who have resilience, who are able to uh, have emotional resilience and passion about who they are and know who they are, are the ones that aren't going to rush off behind the preacher that says the world is coming to the end. I mean, you won't fall into the abyss of, of so-called civilization. You've been listening to On the Block Radio with Andrew Gurevich. The show is produced in Portland, Oregon by Michael DiNapoli at MD Productions. Theme music by Moving the Mountain. Closing music by Jonathan Oak. Look us up on the web at ontheblockradio.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to tune in next week for a brand new episode. Previous episodes can be found on our website. Thanks for listening. Oh, you beautiful kitty kitties. Oh, look at you out there. Beauty like a bolt, light in a darkened hallway. New minds looking at this world and our lives through the perspective of apocalypse children. Standing dusty in the barren highways, standing broken before the fathers who are meant to make us whole, but who only lied to us about what it meant to be a man, about what it meant to be a woman.